the purpose of um, like of this session, and you can see this in breakout two, how off. do we integrate data across uh, um, and do search across metadata and coordinates. Um, and uh, the, the thing we wanted to tackle is both the, the goal of this and the technology. Uh, and I think we have uh, a couple of different scales that, that came up in our pre-discussion. One of them is within any single atlas. Um, yeah. And then I think all critically is across atlases. I didn't notice it. Um, let, me, let me watch this part. Wait, wait. If somebody has their, uh, somebody needs to mute, I think. Thank you, Benjamin. Yeah, so uh, so each of the, what we discovered in the uh, initial discussion is each of the um, uh, various Atlas projects already has uh, some of these challenges. And I think the goal for this session, and I think the reason why the organizers put it in is to try to see if there's a possibility of, of building a resource that will span um, all of the different Atlases so that you can actually get integrated search. Um, so you can see from the document, um, which just gets us started, uh, that we had at least three ways we thought about, uh, four ways, sorry, we thought about search. One of them is on metadata fields. I think that's the easiest one to imagine. So that would be a tumor type, for example, or a cell type or a tissue. Um, you could also presumably sort on measurement method or something uh, like that. Even that's going to require an indexing feature across atlases, which hasn't been conceived of, never mind built. Um, the other thing is to search in, in the data space. Um, you might say an easy example is a gene set enrichment is effect effectively a data search. You could say, here's a set of genes that are enriched. Where else is that true? I think a little harder to, um, to set up technically would be, oh, what, this particular image looks like X. Can I find any other image that looks the same? Um, and there was quite a bit of interest in thinking about uh, coordinate spaces. Um, and you know the obvious and simplest coordinate is to imagine it's the same tissue, but within a tissue, you might want to say, wow, what all data is available at a particular resolution for this piece of, let's say, the kidney or a lobe of the liver. Um, and then I think there was quite a bit of interest in thinking about how we're going to design a user interface um, to capture this, because uh, you either have free search in the current world or you have semantic search, free search which would be free text-based search, obviously has some advantages. On the other hand, it's relatively limited in what it will pull up. Semantic search is going to require a prior definition. Um, so that's where we are. So um, with that in mind, um, what I'd like to do is just go through the group. And I'm, I'm hoping we have only one other person on video, but I'm hoping everyone else is going to be an active participant. Um, just say a little word about yourself, just one or two minutes, and, uh, and then say a little bit about what your your areas of interest are with respect to this topic. And we'll, talk, we'll start with you, Albert. Hi, I was wondering why I'm the only other one on, on video, but anyway. So Albert Berger, I'm a professor of computer science at Harriet Watch University in Edinburgh, and I'm part of the Hansley Trust funded Gut Cell Atlas Consortium. And so, so mostly I'm interested in, in uh, the common coordinate framework and how you use that to query across different data sets and how you use different descriptions of location, whether it's a 3D coordinate or whether it's a ontology term or some other mechanism. How do you integrate data across these different localization descriptors, if you like? Thank you. Um, Andrew Grace. Um, so I'm a cardiologist. I'm based in Cambridge in England, and I'm an electrophysiologist. So we basically got some mapping technology. We can map the heartbeat, and we're thinking of localized um, free sampling, we call it, of single cells from within the endocardium. So I'm into spatial um, localization for transcriptomics and similar. Thank you. Thank you. Tyler? Tyler, I think we have a bit of a sound issue. Do you want to? Oh, we lost Tyler. He'll come back. Um, Andrew, do you want to say anything, Andrew, Gra uh, Andrew Grace? I just spoke. Oh, you did, but you, you know what? Now I realize the problem with doing this is that, of course, 
every time someone comes and goes, your screen reorganizes. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Uh, Tyler, are you back? Can you? Um, we're still not hearing you, I'm afraid. Well, we'll go over to um, uh, Daniel. Hi, right, can you all hear me okay? We can. Uh, I am the data management engineer at Stanford and I'm working on the hub map and HTAM projects. So my interest is what we can do with the metadata that we're collecting, uh, how we can make it searchable and accessible to the researchers for the consortium. Fantastic, thank you. And same, are you there, Lim? Perhaps just as an observer, Sarah, do you want to say a word about yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm also part of the H10. My interest is in the metadata side of this and really kind of coordinating it with the kind of sample collection of biospecimen and how we're processing anything from an H&E to some of these more complex technologies. Fantastic. Thank you. And uh, Resham Kokorani? Yeah, this is uh, Resham Kulkarni. I work at the Frederick National Lab for Cancer Research, and I'm currently working on a project called Center for Cancer Data Harmonization. So this is a new project that's building the semantic landscape for uh, the Cancer Research Data Commons. And we are going to have a new project that will come up soon called Cancer Data Aggregator. And the goals for cancer data aggregator are to query across the different nodes. So I, that's why I'm interested in this session. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Varenka? Maybe just an observer, Will Sullivan? Hi, can you hear me? Oh yes, I can, I'm sorry, excuse oh, me. Oh great, sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Um, hi, everybody. I, I'm Berenger Rodriguez de Blasi. I work at a Beringer Ingelheim. I come from the pharma um, perspective of this. Um, I lead the group of exploratory bioinformatics and cancer immunology. And our main goal is to, of course, identify new drug targets around the tumor microenvironment. Um, part of a, one of my group's efforts is meta-analysis of single cell RNA-seq data sets. Um, and of course, we're really quite interested in the efforts of the HCA um, and also how to best query through this data. Um, as we also internally organize our metadata, we want to make sure that it's uh, in, a, in a similar manner as the HCA efforts. Um, and actually, another member of my team is online. Um, that is Hans Heim Lim. I'll let him introduce himself. Hans Heim? Hi. Can you all hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, I'm Hans Heim Lim. I'm a fifth year uh, PhD student and an, an intern in Barenka's team, exploratory bioinformatics team in Barenka Ingelheim. Um, I work on computational uh, projects to um, identify single cell types based on their expression data. And I'm also really interested in how, how we can um, organize the different types of cells and therefore we can query new cells to a existing atlas. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, Bill Sullivan? Hi, my name is William Sullivan. Um, I work at the University of California, Santa Cruz. I'm associated with the uh, data coordination platform for the Human Cell Atlas, as well as uh, another DCC that's working on the California Initiative for Genetic Medicine. Um, I'm kind of interested in, our, in the metadata and kind of how we're going to search and kind of go across the different consortiums. Uh, William Monty? Yes, I'm William Mundy. I'm at the University of South Florida in Tampa. I'm in my area is tissue engineering, um, and biofabrication. And, you know, I'm interested in the common coordinate framework, uh, using some of my um, biofabrication strategies for mapping tissues for for you know for biofabrication methods, in order to you know kind of adapt that to um, actually determine the locations of specific cell types or specific cell structures 
And um, in this particular meeting, I'm just trying to see what kind of strategy you're using to go from one coordinate to another to locate, you know, specific locations on a, you know, cellular scale and see how I can incorporate into the strategies that I'm using. Fantastic. Um, if you haven't been called, I think Becky Steck. That's me. Hi, my name is Becky Steck. I'm from the Kidney Precision Medicine Project, and I lead a team of software developers who are responsible for building our kidney atlas, where we're trying to bring together a lot of spatial data, a variety of omics type, and clinical data as well, all in one interface for people to search and visualize. So I'm very interested in how the heck to search and visualize this data. <laughs> if you haven't, um... If I haven't asked you, um, as yet people keep coming and going, could you just uh, either raise your hand in chat or just shout out? Hi, I'm a shouter. So this is, uh, my name is Ben Hitz. I run the ENCODE Data Coordination Center. Um, I was bouncing in and out uh, across, making sure that we were covering all the sessions. So um, search is important. Um, just want to see what people's ideas are. Maybe I can give insight on the work that we've done at ENCODE. Um, although our, our search is not great, I would say, but um, that's all. Thank you very much. Hey, this is Jonathan Silverstein and I am a uh, recovering general surgeon informatician for um, some, some decades. I am one of the PIs for the infrastructure uh, for HubMap and interested in the various data components, how they come together, and um, have a, a lot of my own scientific work has been in uh, imaging. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Anyone else? I think Tyler put his to the, the sound issue in the chat. I don't know if you want to read oh, it. Yes, he did. Uh, no, Jonathan has got an up in the chat. Am I missing? Tyler? Oh, Tyler, I mean, sorry. Yep. So Tyler, do you want me to read it? Do you see what it says for Tyler? Oh yeah, yeah, it says, Tyler, yes. He says, yes, my audio is still messed up. Well, if you want to tell us any messages, Tyler, we'll read them off. Uh, Sarah, I will read them off for you. Um, so I think um, there is a, a lot of ways to tackle this. I thought a couple of things we could do at the beginning, um, and remember we're going to divide this into two sections, which is first trying to scope the problem and the second one, is uh, to try to work out some solutions. Uh, I think it would be interesting to just get another word or two um, on the common, uh, this, the common coordinate framework that I think HubMap and other groups are working on. I think we've all heard about it or not absolutely sure what it is. I noticed that Resha mentioned the Center for Cancer Research Coordination. I wasn't quite sure what that was, but we'd like to capture that in the notes. Um, and then I think it would be interesting to hear what ENCODE who's actually been through this experience, what they managed to do. Um, one thing I've noticed, and I wanted to, before we go to those individual points, and people are more than welcome to just uh, shout out and, and intercede, is one thing we've noticed over the course of this meeting, and I think this particular group of people is an excellent example, is that uh, there are a lot of experts in the individual centers working on problems like search, um, which are going to be essential for the function of the eventual atlas. Um, they tend typically to be underemphasized, I think, at these steering committees. And I was wondering how much these groups are in touch with each other, because um, certainly for HTAN, it's, to my knowledge, it, it's, it's been, because the, each of the individual programs is fairly, moving, trying to move fairly quickly, there's been relatively little reach, reach out to anything other than existing ontologies, uh, MESH, for example. So the first question I'd ask people is, how many of you have actually worked uh, across multiple consortia so that the first steps of having a common metadata or a common framework um, simply conceived at the level of, of search fields is going to be the same. And just go ahead and um, say, say, yep, absolutely, Ben, you can start. You can do that or you can raise your hand in chat. We'll start with Ben. So, I mean, ENCODE obviously has been around for a while, um, and we do interact with uh, a lot of different consortia. Um, I mean, specifically, uh, Mike Cherry's group has a small team now who works directly with HCA, 
Uh, it's sort of an unnamed group at this point, but Jason Hilton, if you see him around, is sort of leading that group. Um, so we directly interact with HCA. We interact with 40N. 40N actually has a fork of our software, um, although they made sort of extensive modifications to it. And we have like a monthly chat with uh, 40N, uh, mostly to discuss software details, but also general consortia, consortianess. Um, there's two or three other groups that have uh, adopted our software um, specifically, so we interact with them a lot. Um, I think that's probably this, I mean, an IHEC is a, uh, a, a consortia of consortia involved with uh, tracking what we would call like a reference epigenome. So it's mostly ChIP-seq data um, across human tissues. So there's a monthly or bi-monthly meeting there and we're, there's actually, I mentioned this. And sorry, was that called IHEC, did you say? IHEC, I-H-E-C. Uh-huh. Uh, International Human Epigenome Consortium, although it's would be consortia consortium. So that is a there's a there's a IHEC portal um, that aggregates sort of uh, I would say like like really high level process data like from Encode and from a bunch of other groups. You can go look it up. Just Google IHEC data portal. You can check it out. Um, we don't have any, there's no, so I guess that's kind of an example of like a cross search engine and that someone has sort of pulled in like subsets of metadata from uh, the different groups and sort of harmonized them into sort of a uh, a simple system and you can, there's like a little matrix and you can like put it on a genome browser. Um, you can't, like, I'm not sure how effective it is to like linking back. It's sort of a primitive thing. Um, to what extent is something like that also captured in, you know, these, um, uh, you know, the, these higher level genome browsers you have, a re one has already that sort of aggregate from multiple sources. I guess what they, again, it's your point, they don't take you back to the primary data very well. They just present um, an well, aggregated. Well, there's picture. specifically, there's two, or I guess there's two or three main ones that we deal with. So you see Santa Cruz, um, uh, and in some sense, like the Washington U epigenome browser and then Ensemble, we link out to those genome browsers, but we don't, like it's sort of on their, like if you're trying to organize groups of tracks or organize groups of groups of groups of tracks or whatever, or, or groups of data, like that's done by the visualization teams themselves. We don't really, like, like our, our, our approach to this problem is to just essentially, give you an API for where you can find the data and how you can search it and look it up. And like raw text search is not a strong uh, point of the ENCODE portal uh, at all. Um, if you ever try to use it, it, we have like a whole list of things that don't search very well. Um, we focus more on like our faceted search by tracking individual metadata fields, which um, is better for some things and worse for other things. But uh, so we, we, our feeling is that if you, uh, and then also um, if you're familiar with like Ares Aiden's work with uh, high C data, he has a genome, he has a, like a 3D browser that pulls in data from ENCODE specifically. Um, it, it, the way that we just sort of act as like a hub of where you can access the data that you're interested in and then you, the application developer have to worry about like how you're actually going to present it to somebody. Um, that sounds great. Thank you. I mean, it's interesting even within a set of genome, largely genome data types, it remains challenging. Never mind as we go across others. Quick question for you, Sarah. Are we editing on the same document? Um, That's a good question. I was still on the main document. Is there a separate document? Just there's the a 17B document. Okay, that's why. I'll, I'll copy what I put into the other document. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. For some reason, it, it, the organizers did this duplication that was a little bit confusing to us last night when we looked at it. Um, okay. There had been, I think it was Will Mondi or somebody had mentioned earlier um, the sort of whole co common coordinate framework, the CCF that is being developed by uh, maybe by more than one organization, but that has come up for HubMap. Does anyone want to tell us a little bit about that, where that stands?
did we lose our expertise on common? Ah, oh, there we are. Uh, it was you. Was it? It was you, Albert, who mentioned. I, I did mention it, but that's, um, it's early days. So, so I, I've joined the uh, Gut Cell Atlas Consortia, and th there is, like in any other organs uh, context, the, the discussion about what should the CCF look like and what should it uh, facilitate. And it, it's it's there is no experience yet, so I can't report. I can give you questions, but I don't have any insight into what other uh, people have done. There is a, a fair amount of work on other organs. So there's a lot of CCF work, I think, that's been done on lung, for example. And there's some really interesting uh, papers and some presentations about that. I don't know if anybody's from these other groups is here, but um, personally, I, I have got my questions and answers at this point. Yeah. This so is what, the what would you say is the so what's the underlying concept there? I mean, I've seen, I've seen these be integrated both on physical features, which is useful in a normal tissue. They could obviously be, there could be a common reference frame having to do with cell types. So you have a census that then varies. So um, can you give us a bit of a sense of what the sort of underlying, um, and I'm gonna stop editing Sarah while you're doing the cut and paste. Um, what, what is the underlying sort of conceptual framework here? Well, our first approach is to try to uh, localize the, the, the source of the cell type that are being analyzed in an anatomical context. So where, where the, the tissue in the gut come from that, that's being looked at or studied. Um, uh, but there are other ways to, to tackle it, like you just said. Um, but from our point, it's a localization of uh, the, the cell origins in the organism or in the organ in the gut in this case. So you could imagine in the gut case, you know, that every, you know, the, every crypt even within a single individual, but never mind across individuals are going to be somewhat different. So how does one deal in the CCF with inter-individual or in this, in the case of say a crypt, for the example, inter-instance variability? A uh, good question. I don't know. Um, I mean, we, we've made the point that the gut in particular is pretty painful because it's uh, how it's different from one organ from one person to another. But uh, yesterday there was a conversation where somebody claimed the the brain is fairly um, well structured and, 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 and the framework is easily transferred from one person to another, which was then uh, immediately shut down by somebody who's working in the area saying, no, actually, um, even in the brain, the variation is, is quite significant. Um, I think for, for what we're doing in the, with the gut in the first instance, well, you get the information that you can get. Uh, the, the, the way this, our particular project is uh, structured is we, we will get um, portions of, of gut that have been removed surgically for, for a clinical purpose. And then the, the surgeon or the, the clinical people will tell us where that thing came from. Um, <clears throat> but that will be quite rough uh, and quite uh, imprecise, I think. And where we take it from, I don't know yet. Uh, I think in other organs, this is a little bit better, perhaps. And also when you have well, the one thing I can tell you to make you feel encouraged, Albert, in the case of tumors, it's far worse <laughs> because well, I, you know, I think when you get to disease tissue, there are many more ways to be diseased than to be normal. Well, so. there's that as well. Yeah. Um, so, but I think uh, there's somebody else who was going to say something about the CCF in the area. Yeah. Absolutely, this is, please. This is Yan Su um, from Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. I'm involved in the LEMAP and uh, uh, and in terms of the LEMAP phase two, the DCC actually has a combined efforts from the CCHMC uh, and the broad and the UCSC. So try to get the you know search uh, functions to be uh, unified uh, to get you know in, uh, compatible with the HCA and uh, with the UCSD genome browser. And, so what uh, would be, what, how would you, would you, are you then going to search on, coming uh, back to Albert's point, is it on particular structures, regions of the lung, cell right. types? Right. Currently, uh, our focus is, uh, you know, um, so from the, the, uh, the basic essential search function is search by gene, search by cell, and search by region. 
So how would search by region be? Is that is that based on overall anatomic location? Based on uh, LEMAT phase one developed uh, uh, quite comprehensive, not complete, right? Uh, the the um, basically the the ontology uh, like uh, anatomic ontology direction and the dictionary based on the tree. You can click on each branch to search the cells in this region and search the genes associated with each cell type. Fantastic, thank you. And then I think we had, um, I think it was, uh, if Reshram is still here, she had mentioned her being involved in the, um, in the cancer data harmonization. Do you wanna just say, uh, if, if you had a moment, Reshram, could you say a word about how that effort, it sounds a bit like uh, what we were just hearing from you is that it's something that it could then, but, but then has to span across multiple tissues. Yeah, so uh, again, uh, this is Resham Kulkarni. I work at the Frederick National Lab uh, and we are working closely with NCI. Uh, so I'm serving as the project manager on the Center for Cancer Data Harmonization, uh, which is a new project that started last year and it's being led uh, by Melissa Handel at Oregon State University. Uh, so the goals of uh, the CCDH project are to work with the different data common nodes as well as data coordinating centers. Uh, so each of these nodes uh, and uh, the data coordinating centers have developed independently and H10 is one of uh, the data coordinating centers. Uh, so what we want to do is enable query across all of these different nodes and uh, one of uh, the goals for CCDH project is to build a harmonized data model and also harmonize on the terminologies and metadata that is being used uh, so that uh, query is possible. And uh, the CCDH project will build this harmonized data model. And then we have a new project that is coming up soon called the Cancer Data Aggregator. And this project will use this harmonized data model and then build a system that will enable query across all of these nodes. Uh, so this new project will also build APIs uh, that will help uh, with the query. Uh, so that's a summary. If you have any specific questions, uh, I can try to address those. Yeah, it sounds very interesting. Sounds very, <clears throat> it sounds um, very both essential and ambitious. Um, here we have at least, so we've gotten a couple of sort of experiences and resources up. Does anyone else want to uh, contribute any other either observations or suggestions um, of things that, that are going to be relevant? Because I mean, right now I think we're in the phase of problem definition and, um, and uh, sort of resource determination. Um, so any contributions, most welcome. Uh, this is Albert again. If I just yesterday there was a session on CCF which was chaired by Katie Burner, and um, what she showed there was what they call anatomical structures and cell type tables, and basically what they did for several organs now. I'm sorry, Albert. Where, do you know where that was? In which section? Oh, yeah, it was the, the common coordinate framework. Uh, was was that one of the working? Group, that was one of the working groups. Yeah. Oh yeah, you're right there. Okay, so we'll reference back to, um, Sarah, we'll go back and later on after this session, pull that out from the CCF. Thank you. I didn't even notice that. And, and there, the, the um, several people have now referred to vocabularies or, on, or ontologies. They are structured around patronomy, so it's a part of structures of the anatomy down to small parts and then the cell types that are found in there. So I think there's some work done in this area uh, by people. You know, my general observation on these things, which is a non-expert one, be interesting to see what people think. First of all, is obviously the hard thing with ontologies is the more detailed they get, the harder they are to use. Um, and the other thing is, as a general rule, um, and you particularly see this at organizations like EBI, there are a huge number of ontologies where nobody's built the sort of tool to instantiate them and search them. So I think building these ontologies is critical, but um, it'll be also very interesting to see how we manage to actually then utilize them in a, in, in a general basis. Um, so we'll go back and pull out what came out of the Monday 
output there. Any other um, comments or suggestions? Just as a clarification, is that associated with a particular consortium? For Katie Browners, uh, out of the CCF discussion? I don't know the answer. Do you know that, Albert, who Katie was her consortium? Uh, no, not at all. My understanding is she's associated with HubMap, but I don't want to misspeak. Uh, we'll figure that out. She's working with HubMap. Thank okay. you, Becky. Thank you very much. Yeah, so what, um, that's great. So um, I see we've had a few new people join us. Rather than have people introduce themselves at this point, um, if anyone wants to chime in right now, we're in the sort of problem definition resource um, uh, sort of uh, determination. And uh, we've come up with a couple of uh, existing efforts that are underway or that have been underway for some time, and, and those can be viewed in document 17B. Um, any other uh, comments or thoughts? Um, I had a question regarding the um, annotation component of cell types. Um, I mean, w would it make sense to kind of have them in two categories, right? Like the broad classification of cell type, and then, of course, there are specific subsets within those cell types. An example of that is, for example, say when you look at tumor data sets, single cell, um, you know, very easily you can identify where the myeloid cells, the T cells, based on basic markers that give you that broad classification. Um, so at times I find it difficult when there's different, and it, you know, there's, they go maybe too deep or uh, too broad, and it's hard to query across multiple data sets to know um, even where, where the broad is coming from, or, you know what I mean? It, it's easier to say, I want to take all the data sets that have myeloid cells, and then myself go into them and annotate them myself with um, our own uh, markers for myeloid. But it's really difficult to do that when you find papers that have already gone into the myeloid and subset of them further. Um, and it's hard to kind of trace back to that. So maybe having that structure of broad cell classification versus specific, because it, the more that we find is that the specific types are either, is it really a cell um, type or is it in a state that um, would then be user defined? Um, as a specific cell cell type, right? Um, that's just one of the comments um, I wanted to make about that. I think an ontology, I mean, to your, it's a very interesting point. I think an ontology would aim, you know, to have different levels of abstraction. You know, you'd be all the way down at highly subclassified mm -hmm. cell types and say, wow, those are all T cells. I think one of the issues, and I wonder if any of the, um, groups have really started to tackle this is, is certainly at the current stage of understanding the way you define a cell type is integral to the way you measure it. Um, so, you know, the measurements are not all equivalently deep. So, you know, you might have something only as a T cell in one class, T, say T cell versus B cell, um, and you might have a much more detailed classification in the case of a different technology, but um, you might have that only in others. And those different levels of, of, of study and technology dependence in the classification is, I think, one of the complexities. Um, uh, yeah, and I think that moves to, like, my one of my second points is if it could also be queryable, like, what platform they use to generate the data, right? This, uh, and we see yeah. that more and more with the single cell data is, like, we have, um, say, who, like, go through the TenX or the SmartSeq or the old Fluidime systems and... It's just then integrating that really there's other concerns around data integration with different platforms. Um, but I don't know. So if that one specific be proposal, see if this would address that, that we started to implement in HTAN is that all protocols, which would be a platform plus a method, are mm -hmm. put on a, pl on, on a common place. And right now that's turning out to be protocols.io. Uh, where they get a DOI. So every data set is then tagged with the DOI that says how it arose. Um, that allows you to trace it back, but it does suggest there needs to be some kind of ontology of collection because you don't necessarily want to go, you, you want to know how, how different is X from Y if you're doing a large search. Um, right. It sounds like search needs to have a kind of ontology of, of method, if that makes sense. 
um, yeah, as well as to link the data to the underlying method. Yeah, you're right. And I think uh, I want to go back to the Varenka um, comment before about um, how that sometimes, you know, the cell ontology is too broad or too specific. And uh, and I'm, uh, I've been working on developing the, the cell ontology and I have to say that uh, obviously when the uh, revision, uh, the revised cell ontology, so the one that we are looking at now has been done, uh, there were not any different uh, technologies. So it was mainly, uh, there was no RNA sequence, single cell RNA. And so the cell was kind of defined from what they were the tools available at the time. And in particular, looking at the minimal markers necessary to define that cells. So this means that they were, you know, only the minimal that you would say in order to define that particular cell type. But obviously now we are having all completely, uh, you know, different type of information about the cell due to the new technology. And, and in fact, there is uh, um, an effort to try to uh, define cell looking at the um, RNA sequencing. And there is an effort to try to create what is called the provisional uh, cell ontology that should be linked to the larger cell ontology, but one of the issue is that all these data coming from the single cell RNA uh, sequencing are um, most of the time not all consistent in the cell type and, um, and that's mainly is due to the uh, method of analysis, so which algorithm has been used to cluster the cells. And the other thing is that we are talking about uh, um, RNA expression. And, uh, and so sometimes, as uh, Varenka said, that could refer, instead of to the cell type, to the different states of the cell. But, you know, exactly the same cell type, but in different states. And that's what we have discussed in a previous uh, uh, session, where we came um, at the conclusion that we need to have some way to define the cell states that are different from the cell type, but they need to be uh, related to in order to have, be able to do what Varenka was saying was difficult at the moment. One question, um, that's great. Thank you very much, Anna Maria. One, I think one question about all these ontologies is to what extent has, has anyone seen uh, implementations of this that are probabilistic? Um, you know, things get, tend to get put into binary classification. But of course, what most measurement does is it gives you a probability of being a cell type. And, um, and that would be both, you know, you would need some probability of being more than one type, but you must also be somewhere different in the tree. Um, so it would be essentially a probabilistic search. And, you know, generally, you know, coming from the side of somebody who does much of the measurement um, on these things, you know, we are, even going back to flow, you know, artificial gates are put in, and uh, there, there's a lot of sort of this is a kind of artificial precision to some of this measurement. So um, um, I'm sure there are a lot of thoughts. Anybody um, who hasn't spoken so far have a thought on that or seen an implementation or um, interested in that question? Anybody who has any opinion at all? Um, What I can say is that from the ontology point of view, you're right. The ontology is trying to define uh, the thing by them, themselves, so it's not a probabilistic. Either you are a T cell or you are not. <laughs> That's what it is. But uh, I think could be uh, if we have, uh, um, like, if we could represent this. Uh, states and in addition we could represent this more complex vision of a cell type you know like implemented with this other uh, type of really representation like with the sequencing data etc i think that uh, could in a way make you you know do this study of probabilistic you could be this and that or could be in this state instead of the other but from the point of view, the representation in the, in the ontology, it cannot be probabilistic because it's the, the, 
you know, is the main point of the ontology to define one thing because it's that thing, so it cannot be in the middle. Well, I th I, you know, I see this as a huge mm -hmm. conceptual and practical challenge because one thing we're learning from single cell studies ex vivo, where they have a strong time dimension and, you know, live cell imaging, et cetera, is that in fact cells naturally over time fluctuate in and out of state, even if they're primarily of a single state. So, um, and that all cell types or all features of cells essentially are distributed, probably log normally distributed. So, so there, there is this stochastic component that I think um, probably needs, and, and then on top of that is the in, imprecision of measurement. Um, Jonathan, it looks like you have something you wanted to add. Yeah, thanks, uh, Peter. So, um, you know, going way back 30 years, the first paper I was involved with as a medical student was using belief networks across uh, ontologies in order to do, um, you know, probabilistic reasoning about what was of interest to the to the user, right? And so this is this type of technique is driving everything from search to um, causal discovery. And other things. So I, I do think that while the design of these networks to this to this point, in some cases, are designed by humans thinking of strict classification, there's a whole literature of use of these same technological structures where every link has probability associated with it and every entity has probability associated with it. So I don't think I don't think there's a lot to invent in that regard in our use. I think it's more figuring out how the problems we're trying to solve align with those computational techniques. That's fantastic. I was hoping somebody would bring up belief networks, right? Because I think you're right, actually, is I think we've, we've ended up in this uh, somewhat artificial position with respect to the biology and also one, uh, this binary calling that's actually not even technologically necessary. So it's become more a habit of mind. Um, um, and look, you know, the, it goes all the way to thinking about clinical data where you have a continuous variable on response and we say these are responders and non-responders we seem to be continuously caught in the trap of taking unimodal distributions and putting arbitrary thresholds on them i think largely for the purpose of decision making but i don't think that it would be necessary for the purpose of search um fantastic point thank you jonathan um anyone else can i uh just ask a question of clarification about what we mean to integrate because there's one thing and that is sending out a query through one interface to multiple resources and getting back multiple web page links and then as a user you're supposed to sift through that and, and, and construct some kind of answer and the other category is where, where the integration software actually integrates the results which are coming back and it's not quite clear what what we are aiming at here and what the current state of affairs is in, in, in that respect. Do people automatically integrate the results or is it all left to the user? It's a fantastic point. Um, I mean, let, so I think let's pivot to the point you've brought, uh, Albert, because I think it gets to the question of what, what do we mean even by search? Um, the, uh, so the easiest kind of search, of course, and, Somebody correct me if they want to have a different view of this. Is just a pure text-based search, um, you know, a Google-type text-based search, which then has some underlying uh, way of trying to evaluate the quality of the return. In the, I, I think, in the case of many webs, it's how many times it's itself been searched. Then you would have a semantic search, I think, or some kind of semantic search, and that would run against an ontology. And I think we've been talking a lot about that right now. Um, and, and, and how would we integrate, and how do we deal with inaccuracy? Um, and that's where these belief um, belief models come in. Um, but, but but then the other one is a kind of integrated search. I mean, are we going to allow people to do what you couldn't do like with an SQL query where you can actually put logical functions in, you know, fall, find all examples of long and single cell sequencing or something like that. And um, and and those, those are actually challenging as well, right? It's hard to to take a, and I think there's one thing that it'd be interesting to see what the other session has. There's a lot of enthusiasm to moving everything onto the cloud, but I think as we all know in current database structures, arbitrary SQL queries against databases are, are extremely problematic, which is why most people end up downloading large data sets. So, um, 
So I think Ooh. let's add to that, but you know, the simplest search would be text, then there would be a kind of, we wanna call it semantic or ontological search. Um, and then the other one would be some kind of logic-based search. None of those achieve what you're suggesting, Albert, which is that they actually truly achieve an integration. It would at least be a, a, a retrieval mechanism. Yeah, Varenka and then Jonathan, excuse me. Um, I would say that that's like the current priority, right? Like to be able to at least be able to search and find um, accurately. And then the way I see it, the even the method, if you talk about methodology for data integration, I mean, that's still even being worked on and generated by individual groups, right? The other part um, to add to actually what um, Ana Maria was mentioning is from these um, single cell studies are published and say, you know, you get to the point where you have these broad and specific cell um, classifications. It's also really important to take note of the method that they use for tissue, tissue dissociation. It's very different across every different lab. And I can tell you, I've been doing, um, you know, testing like four different methods just to get to the point of having um, fibroblast populations and every method is very different, right? Like some are very uh, more stringent on the cancer cells, some of you totally deplete and immune uh, subset, and this is all talking from the same tumor. Um, so even that part to me, it's a little puzzling because even say after having this set up where I can find the paper, I have to go in and really dissect their protocols, so they actually got it to put it into interpretation before we can even talk about data integration. Um, so that could also be a factor. And I see that it might not be true priority for, um, you know, building this easily queryable data, um, but it's something that I, I kind of want to, I join this just to advocate for that because it, it will make everybody's life easier. And I think people that are on the bench actually generating these data sets would agree with me that to some extent, it's really important to be able to just find that as easily as it is, as it would be to find whether it's a mouse or human um, sample. No, I think that's a critical thing. And as I mentioned before, I think you should, you should look into what's emerging with something like protocols.io, it doesn't solve all these problems, but it's a shareable um, sort of protocol resource that can have nested DOI. So if you do a derivative, but you can also fork them. So it's like a code type repository where you can fork a protocol. Um, so that allows you at least to unambiguously flag data sets with, and since it's a de derivative DOI structure, you can find the parent DOI and you could potentially search on that. So there's at least some step forward. That hasn't been the norm because particularly in sequence data, the presumption is, you know, as long as the machine's working well, the sequence is fairly reliable. Um, um, thank you very much, Jonathan, again. Yeah, so I was gonna mention protocols.io also, so thank you for that. But um, what I was gonna say is, you know, there's these distinguished parts of cross query. One is that you have some annotation according to some reference. And that's a thing that we need to start. And the approach that we're taking in HubMap, and you know, I've, I've really recommended is don't get too hung up on which things you're gonna annotate with, because we'll get the vocabularies to work with each other uh, through various cross-referencing, but choose one that's popularly used and make sure that you're annotating at every level of detail that you can to existing reference terminologies. Because without that, you get nothing, right? I mean, we're, we're not gonna do an N by M correlation of the random thoughts of, um, you know, assigning ontologic values to different things. We need to really be working from reference terminologies that, that exist. Now, many of the things they don't exist, and that's a whole nother discussion we had earlier today about cell ontologies and things that need to be created. But for the ones that do exist, you know, assigning those reference terminologies. So we're separating these different concerns. So we have Docker container containing Neo4j graphs with multiple ontologies cross-reference through GUIs and X references as a thing. So you can do all that query navigation APIs to travel amongst the ontologies as one thing. A separate thing is the provenance in which you have the entities and you have all kinds of um, JSON annotations of the various uh, ontological things that apply to those various different data sets. 
And with the APIs and the two together, um, you know, we've not proven it out yet, but this is what we're building. Um, one can navigate amongst the ontology, navigate amongst the entities and select and query against the things you're interested in. And in order to make that super efficient um, for <coughs> principally Nils as his principal user writing this stuff, I think he's still on this call. Um, we are then taking those things and pulling them in various ways into Elasticsearch. So this is this notion of, of several different phases of this that can be distinguished and tackled as reasonable executable problems as opposed to having this ball of wax kind of spaghetti intersecting problems. So we dist distinctly separate the ontology bit from the provenance bit and the labeling. And then what we do is for, for search, we take those things and Niels principally, his team and others give us specifications and say, I'd love to have an elastic search um, that looks like this. And these are the structures that are in it and it's generally worked out this way. We then transform into that. And so we have tools that are other Docker containers that are specific, what I would call application databases. So we specifically distinguish from a storage structure that is very close to the data and an application database structure that's very close to the application such that when you're doing the visualizations, you don't have to stand on your head and go back to thinking about um, the ontologic or the provenance data. And so by separating these different concerns into the parts that they are manageable with microservices between them and APIs is the approach that we're taking for HubMap. It's quite a, you know, sort of a tour de force in some sense. In another sense, it's extremely simple. I mean, we've made something that each part of it stands alone. It's incredibly simple. We can take in different ontologies. We don't really care what you're using as long as the reference items that you're annotating your data sets with exist in our model. Um, so does that, so that's Jonathan, kind of a, does, a, Do you or um, anyone else want to say a word about, as we talk about it, somebody wanted to come in. I, over, I spoke over them. Excuse me. Was someone wanting to say something? No, no, no. It was me again. Go ahead, Peter. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. I was just going to say, do people want to talk also as we think about, uh, you know, searching against uh, ontologies and different types of search against them, um, you know, having controlled vocabularies. Um, the question also arises with regard to precision and things like Miami. So we'll remember back when we, we had the original Miami concept of minimum information, um, that allowed us to make sure that every piece of data had at least some minimal metadata tagging against which you could search. And, and that was found to be necessary because in the absence of strong tools, um, the amount of metadata association in the real world tended to be fairly weak. Um, so this actually goes up front, I think, more as opposed to post-processing how many cell types you had. It gets back a little bit to what Varenka was talking about, how much data do you associate up front with collection? Does it, and is it sort of a minimum standard or a deeper standard? And wondering what I mean, I, I, would, I would have a quick comment on that. Part of what I was describing is that the minimum standard is really, really minimized. Like, you know, the, uh, yeah. the provenance of where did this thing come from and what do you call it? And then on the flip side of that, though, you're strongly encouraged to provide as much context as you can within a framework that allows you uh, a reference framework. So the, so the, this is kind of, um, you know, a, a next phase of that in my way of thinking. I mean, in, I may be overdoing this in this very expert um, room. I'm often trying to explain this to folks that simply don't understand, but, um, the idea being that the minimum was truly minimum. Where did it come yeah. from? You know, what's the, what's the date on it? What specimen did it derive from? And then annotate the heck out of it with all these reference uh, terminologies that allow you to do the thing that we're largely doing right now, it, w w which is discovery of these data yeah. sets, right? I mean, so will this approach solve everything? No, but it'll get us a heck of a lot farther on discovery of data sets, which is where we're really stuck. Well, one thing that let's uh, pass it on to any other comments. I think, Jonathan, one thing that's very impressive about that is to actually, you know, build tools. And I alluded to that before. I mean, when you have uh, a deeper, a deeper metadata annotation, if you have a very efficient tool that allows you to apply it in batch, for example, to validate against, you know, validate against um, a predetermined standard that helps. What, what I found in most of the NIH projects that I've been in is there's been no, no investment in those tools. So as a consequence, most of them still are people filling out Excel spreadsheets or some, you know, completely hopeless um, mechanism. Well, um, I'm, I'm not sure we're not doing that, but we're doing <laughs> that and pulling some things from the data sets both. But, um, you know, Niels has a large uh, curation responsibility and has people whose responsibility is working with those spreadsheets. So 
yeah, it, 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 it doesn't go away. It just doesn't go away. It's, it's, it's all about uh, data, data scrubbing. Um, any other comments? Um, so I think we have a bit of a concept of search now. So we've talked a little bit about just even free text search um, is the minimal. I think we just had an example of, uh, from Jonathan, elastic search that can go across um, uh, sort of maybe controlled vocabularies, specific types of entities, et cetera. We might then also have logical searches that could, could span. That's going to require cross platform integration relatively soon. Um, any other comments or ideas for things that we need? I think that having some experience in this area, it's really important to keep in mind what the use cases of the searchers are, because you can hand, you can stick a pile of metadata at, you know, a software engineer and they can come up with various ways of coming up with queries and doing this, but like you, you really need to focus on what what your user base actually wants to do. And it is a very, very hard problem because you don't, you, you, we don't, none of our groups like sell our data, right? So we don't know when we're successful in having successful searches. You don't know when someone uses your web portal, if they had a good time or not, right? That's, there's no feedback. I also mechanism. find in portals, I don't know if you find this with ENCODE band, is people see, you know, there's a particular slice of the data you've made, you know, particular, cross-sectional slice and people look at it and they go, no, no, I want to ask this other question. And I don't think they necessarily appreciate that that is actually a very difficult, different kind of query because these structures are not all relational. Yeah, well, none of our, our structures are relational. Um, yeah. And we also don't allow any qu real query language at all. And, then, and in seven years, it's been very little uh, call from the community to do that. Every once in a while, someone's like, hey, I want to like run a search, but it turns out that like it's so much trouble to like support that from a DevOps point of view that it's practically easier to just say, hey, just you know, download this and write three lines of Python and filter out what you're looking for, right? Um, so, but what about that? What about in the case of let's go to HubMap? It's it's actually a great caution, and I want to, I'm talking over you because I think we need to go for a break for a moment and then we can come back. But just one last word maybe from anybody here, but maybe Jonathan, I could ask him, you pointed out that you actually don't have a query language and get asked a lot for those. Are those things that HubMap is nonetheless gonna to try to do? I was looking to see if Nils is still here. Um, if, do, if you are, please talk over me because this is an area. Nils is in the visualization one. We can just say that Nils is gonna do it and assign it to him if you want. Well, so there's a whole group, there's a whole working group called uh, I forget exactly what it's, it's got data in the name, but, but there's a, a fellow there uh, in, uh, from CMU who, so Nils leads that group uh, with some others. And um, there's a group at CMU that has, uh, under Bob Murphy, that has actually come up with a, a query language approach that does all the set theory and so forth of these kinds of things. Now, that's not gonna be available when we first come forward. And, and to Ben's point of view, um, it may get cut, right? Because we're still early in the consortium. We have all kinds of great ideas and we're, we're checking them against things that are uh, feasible and desired, right? And, um, and so right now it appears feasible and desired, but not in this first release to actually have a query language that does the set theory that is focused on these kind of single cell things where you're trying to query from things that seem so far and distant and unrelated and let, yeah, you have to cross the set somehow to get the answers you're looking for. So whether, you know, clinical features in a donor at the same time of cells that are of this particular type, right? And, and data sets that have those things in common, how do you write a language, you know, how do you set things up in such a way that you can easily um, articulate such a complex thing that you're looking for? So there is some work going on with that. Um, in HubMap, there is no work on implementing it at the present time, but we're thinking that we'll try to throw that in in subsequent year or two. So I agree with Ben, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult and hazardous problem uh, to work I'm gonna leave it there. And um, what I'd like to do is give everyone just five minutes. I probably will miss my bonus payment if I do that. But if we come back in five minutes, uh, East Coast, it's two, 36, so that would have us come back at 241. We'll have 25 minutes to have some solutions at that point. Um, but I think um, what's great about where we are is Ben's even raised the question, do we really need sophisticated search? 
Um, and if we do, I think what, one of the things we heard from Jonathan is even the more advanced projects don't actually have that yet as, a, as, 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 as more than an exploratory work product. I'm trying to remember, we now have to have agency and passion. Sorry, can I just- uh, No, no, up? agency and passion. We, we, it's all we're gonna, no, go ahead, Albert. <laughs> Okay, so I'm quite interested in this querying and, and what I'm trying to understand is whether there's a case for what we call in other contexts a spatial search or a spatial query. And where this is coming from is I used to work on in situ gene expression databases and atlases. And what you had there was a 3D reconstruction of in our case a mouse embryo. And you would get a 2D in situ gene expression image that got mapped into that 3D space. Now, at that point, you could ask your queries either using ontology terms like that's been discussed, or you you'd use a tool and you go into the 3D space and you paint the area you're interested in, and that would do a 3D spatial query based on the 3D coordinate framework. Now, is that something that's not, there's no use for this in the human cell atlas? Or are there use cases for this? or, or are, is that just too complicated? I'm trying to get a feel for how important these kind of spatial uh, spatial queries might be. Yeah, I think it's a great question that we can throw out to the group. Um, I think that um, my own personal feeling is that spatial queries are going to be very critical. I mean, it's going to come around to definition of what space means, which is, I think, why we talked a little bit before about you know these common reference frames, et cetera. Um, but certainly in the brain, you know, partly that somebody said that it was simple and somebody said it was hard. I mean, partly comes back to the fact that there are these well-recognized anatomic regions that have got names. And so you can ask, look in this name. So I think at least at the grosser tissue level, that would strike me as being essential. It's an interesting to see, let's imagine in the kidney, you know, how detailed you could get to individual glomeruli and sort of, you know, substructure. Um, um, I, I think it's an essential part of what we're discussing. But, but that's my point. At some at some level, you, you have to give up on the ontology because you cannot break it down to that level of anatomical granularity. So when you have a 3D voxel-based coordinate frame, you can query at the voxel level. Yeah, you, you get a, you get away from the ontology terms, or you combine them. But you basically have a, a, a true 3D oriented query mechanism. I think that's, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think that's been, mo what I've seen, and correct me if I'm wrong, that's most achieved in cases of these very high resolution, often EM based reconstructions, in which case there was a single exemplar that was constructed, right? So you actually, you, you know, you just, the, the tissue itself is its orientation. I think the interesting thing in most of these projects that are ongoing now, um, both between normal and diseases, you have many, many exemplars. I think we talked about that before. And then how to actually get those into some co common coordinate becomes challenging. Um, even the, uh, the brain atlas from the Allen Institute is largely a reconstruction of one or a very small number of brains. Uh, Sorry, that's my phone. Yeah. So I think we could, so I think we, let's see where we are at the moment is um, if you look at the document we have um, in which Sarah has been doing a beautiful job, we have some definition of the problem. We have some examples. We even started off with wondering whether we needed sophisticated search at all. Um, we talked a little bit about just free search, which already isn't really possible, um, a search across um, entities and controlled vocabularies that would be text-based search. Um, the possibility of having query languages, which we might or might not have uh, as well. And then finally, I think Albert brought us back to the issue of sort of spatial coordinates and searching within space. Um, so I think what we're tasked to do now uh, in this final section for which we have just over 15 or 20 minutes is to begin to suggest ways forward. So if people have practical uh, solutions that they wanna put forward, how they wanna solve this problem, my own observation in this, and I think we heard um, uh, uh, quite a bit of this uh, earlier, is that this is this is an area when actually there's actually uh, quite a substantial requirement. Jonathan pointed this out 
to actually study the problem is actually these are fairly subtle and complex problems. So I think I tend to hear in these conversations, oh, we're going to have search and it's going to do this and that, and without necessarily uh, having having thought through some of the technical complexity. So so rather than reiterate that point, I think what we want to now think is what would be a couple of concrete things we could do to get us to a cross-platform search on a controlled vocabulary or the first generation of a spatial search? Well, to do that engineering, you need specs, right? The specs are probably not the hardest part of it. To get the specs, what would, would, would probably make sense, and this is something we did not do at all um, in the beginning of ENCODE, and I think that we've done a little bit lately, but I actually think what you want to do is like think about user testing, right? I mean, the problem with user testing, we did a, a big, uh, not a big, but a little user testing experiment back in like years ago with, with the East Genome Database. And user testing is kind of expensive and tedious, right? It, it costs money. You have to assemble a fairly large representative sample of people. You have to have them hang out and like, you know, use your stuff or, or try to figure out what they want. You need to do sort of market research in order to figure out what it's even worth building a search engine for. But for example, spatial search sounds really cool, right? Wow, I, I love this search, you know, somebody's organism in 3D coordinates in order to get single cell data. But wait, I don't, I don't actually want to do that. Like if somebody wants to do that, they have to have like, you, you need, you need to serve the community in terms of who wants to do that. That's my spiel. And so, so what I would say yep. is like, before you so this even seems to me why this is this is why Ben this is one of these what do they call them wicked problems right is yes. that until we have some level of search I think it's hard for people to conceive of what they're going to search for but I think those of us who built these kind of resources I know we built one for chem informatics with a specific use case in mind and all our users came with a completely unrelated use case and so all the search functionality turned out to be orthogonal to the user needs there is actually if we specifically want user testing there is in um, there is a one of the big government branches actually has an, an user testing capacity that's quite sophisticated that got used in one of our links projects that one could draw on. So so actually there is a national resource for doing that. They were quite sophisticated. Actually. If you could find such a link, it'd be cool to. Yeah, I'll try, to, I'll try to remember that as we go on. Okay, so one of the things we would need to get anywhere was we need to have some spec. We need to know what are people going to search for. Um, I just have a quick comment. I don't know if this came up because I've been in and out, uh, and my apologies for that, but um, there is this CFDE effort, which those of us that have common fund related um, centers that is trying to just do, a, in essence, data discovery across all the things that Common Fund has already built in all of these portals. And so I think any effort in this regard should be informed in some way by that effort. It, the scope of that effort is an, a small RFA to get different Common Fund programs to work together, plus a requirement for all 13 of them that are, D, and only the DCCs that are Common Funds can apply to this. So this is a thing that specifically names 13 applicants. Um, and a piece of it is a certain amount of description of their data sets such that they can all be found. So that one can make a common fund say, this is all the stuff we've supported and all the data that's been generated. And you can find, you know, X number of these things and X number of those things. It is intelligently highly, highly limited to try to do something that would actually serve that initial uh, use case without getting a lot deeper but I think it's at sort of the very highest level with the least amount of functionality addressing the identical problem within yep. a set of these consortia. So we should try to capture that. I mean, one interesting thing that, so I've now been in two common funds um, and the DCCs have largely had nothing to do with the data collection <laughs> enterprises, right? So I think it comes back to Ben's issue is that they've set off in their own direction. Um, so. The very fact that that's the case, I mean, it seems like that's much less true in HubMap, um, but um, the fact that that's the case shows that your perception of the questions that are going to get asked strongly shapes the, um, the resulting outcome. Yeah, I mean, in some ways that use case is almost a trivial administrative one that the NIH needs to address 
to make the case that they've created all this stuff. Um, so it's, it's, so I, I don't want to overemphasize that it's a bit off topic of what we're trying to really do, but it's a first baby step that does have some money behind it. Yeah. So let's definitely, um, wherever we are on editing here, um, Sarah, let's definitely try to capture, uh, this common fund yep, CFDE, right which is, I think it's yeah, a common, common fund. fund common fund data ecosystem, I think. Ecosystem. Yeah. ecosystem. Sort of like a, I, sort I was of like a yeah, it's yep. sort of like a footnote of be informed by that. Excellent. Other comments? Um, I just have a question of, are you, we trying to fill up the blue box now or that's what we're doing when we go back into plenary as, as a group? Right now you're working on the part minutes? two, you, you're working on the part two section of the document? Yep. Yeah, that's correct. I think that's where it is. And then uh, gosh, you know, I, the final template, I think we go, I, I can't remember who does that, but we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out in the next step. I think we do that once we read through and um, then we get some help also from the KI folk on that. Yeah, my so, sense is that the blue thing is mostly done when this session is done is the way the others I've seen. Um, but I, I don't know if that's a requirement or if that's just what people have tried to do. Yeah, I think what we could do since, since we have a slightly shorter here because we're going back into plenary, Sarah, we can continue to work on that while we go back into the plenary. Um, and people, obviously, everyone here is then welcome to edit. Um, any other comments, sort of solutions? So, um, you know, one thing we've heard is going to be critical is sort of user testing. And that comes also from Ben's point about user cases, test cases. Um, we've heard there is an effort in the common fund to do this. Um, we've heard some sense of sort of rough, rough specs for what this might do. Um, other suggestions? I, I, you know, one other suggestion that I had now that I'm going to introduce, say, and, and see if people who are interested in this is I actually think it would be helpful if the expertise across these various centers is brought together in some form. And I think it sounded as though, Jonathan, there was some beginning of that under, um, no, actually, I think it was Ben mentioned that there's some, some extent to which a couple of the centers actually already get together uh, and, and, and I think this is one of these cross-cutting things. We're very much organized at the moment by these, all of our efforts by, in, we're integrated vertically sort of from data collection to data release, but we're not very well connected horizontally by expertise. So I think that could be one thing that would be helpful. Um, anyone uh, who has other ideas, please pitch them in now. And just based on our experience, it seems like the, the user testing, you cannot be start too early. If you just give the survey, ask what them, uh, you know, what they want, you usually didn't get anything uh, useful until you build up something, you know, if they like it, they will tell you, we love it, we use it. Well, you know, that's the sort of agile concept. You got to throw something <laughs> so, up. Right. To, so, to so, make that feasible, Sorry, I'm interrupting you, but I think you know to make that feasible, it would be helpful if any one of the many projects, because you know, lung map and kidney and HTAM, they have many common features to them, right? If we took one exemplar and began to iterate on a user testing in a cross-disciplinary way, that would probably provide answers for everybody, um, because otherwise, what you can't do is throw up, you know, 50 test cases for 50 different projects all at the same time. That's true. It's like how we clinically test immuno-oncology drugs now. That's true. Yeah. So for the developer and the, uh, during the, you know, tool search engine developing stage, you should have some like the, hopefully some of the biology uh, demand in, in mind, I guess, when you develop that. Well, it could be biology, but I think, you know, uh, one of the things that a lot of the, uh, I've noticed a lot of the individual programs are doing is they have a sandbox where people are already beginning to play with analytical algorithms. And I think here's a place, speculatively, you could imagine for the whole purpose of defining search concepts that you could have a single sandbox. It could even be the common fund one like HubMap would be a great one because in principle, all U.S. programs are bought into it, um, mm -hmm. you know, and you would have a sandbox where people could come and observe what was working and what wasn't, rather than having to reinvent the wheel each time in their own session. That that's true. Yeah, so kind of the playground. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it sounded as though Nils is willing to take on organizing that. He's not here to say no, so we'll take that as an implicit yes. Um, anyone else have an idea? Um, something they want to get down into this document?
so I guess the, the last thing we um, were asked to do is, is, is it worth, are people here interested in having a meeting around this coming together again? And so I think particularly the people, you know, Ben, Jonathan, um, um, Resham, so people who, and it could be anybody, of course, who's beginning to think about this, Anna Maria, you know, the, the, the sort of whole problem of search and how search would work, would it be helpful to have a, a meeting defined by a particular set of technical problems and expertise happen to see what cross-functional resources could be built, um, as opposed to one organized, as most meetings are now, by um, the specific topic area? Let me know if you think it's a good idea or a bad idea. Raise your hand or speak out. I'm trying to sort of wrap my head around the idea of a meeting involving search technologies. Um, I think it's something that's hard to collaborate on in like a one day, two day framework. I mean, I think going back to the search integration ideas is that one of the reasons why it's challenging is because it's a software issue. And so, you know, you have to like, or you mentioned, what I'm trying to get at is you were mentioning like how these projects are vertically organized well and horizontally organized poorly. But I think that's because they don't share a lot of software. So they don't share a lot of direct data models and you can try to transform them, but that's just writing more software that really no one's funded to do, so. And why why do they not sharing more software, do you think? Oh, because that's not how people develop software. <laughs> like, this is not how it's done. Like, someone someone might adopt it because, because most of the software- Oh, I, that, see, I see what you're saying. You're saying as the software is being developed, it's not being shared. Not that when it's gotten to some stage of release, it's not being shared, because mainly these are yeah, they're open, they're open source. source, but have you ever actually, like a lot of the, so, like we, there are a couple, like I mentioned, there's a couple of groups that use ver versions of our software, but like that's like three groups, right? And and there's, it's sort of, it just ends up, it, it basically, what I mean by it depends on the engineer is that it's actually really difficult to modify and extend other people's software if it's not a huge basis of like, like, you know, sort of open source people who are working on it constantly, right? It just tends to be much easier for developers to develop, to, to develop their own software because they wrote it. And then it doesn't, like, I borrow somebody's software, it doesn't quite fit the mechanisms. I mean, there it can work, but, and it, people, I, in my experience, like data coordination centers, centers in general are massively underfunded relative to their, um, like the amount of data they have. Well, I think that, so Ben, I'm going to interrupt quickly in case we get pulled away. So I actually completely agree with you as an experimental scientist. You know, I think that the data analysis in these problems is 40, 40 or 50% of the total problem. And the budget allotted to this is less than 10%. And I think we keep coming up with this. But I think one thing that could come out of this, you know, and if there was a, a, a meeting around search technologies, if that was an outcome, one of the things could just be to realistically scope what can be expected. Because I think there's this expectation, and this has happened to me in all these common fund projects as well, of this kind of make sure it's on my cell phone and I can, you know, arbitrarily merge data sets in the cloud and with, without much appreciation for the engineering that would be required to do that. So if the resources are X, I think it would be a good thing for this group to be able to define here is what search looks like. And at one extreme, you know, is a reasonably sophisticated kind of ontological search that's gonna require some merger. At the other extreme is what you've said is virtually no search at all, right? That, you know, maybe all you can do is find a data set based on a couple of keyword terms or a couple of metadata terms, and then you integrate. But I think even to scope putting forward the idea even to scope for the leadership what is achievable here would be helpful because I do see at the levels of the steering committees of our meetings fairly fantastical notions about what's actually achievable um, which is really you know sort of arbitrary query across all data and you know the um, common fund effort that uh, was mentioned earlier um, is uh, the CFDE um, you know, that, that's a, just a drop in that bucket. So, um, 
So one of the things would be to say, here's what the state of search is and here's what could be achieved and actually work towards something practical rather than never achieve something fanciful. Sure, I mean, and I think maybe a meeting to get to like, maybe it works if we present a common front in some sense to the various pressures of like, you should do this ridiculous thing. I mean, I find it like, I get that a lot. I've, I've heard that a lot over the years too, where people, oh, you know, you should have something that does this ridiculous, fantastic thing. It turns out they actually don't even really want that. They don't really know what they want. And so they want something that does everything just in case they come up with something that does what they want. Well, I know that the, uh, the, the other working group that we have in here, that we talked about this a lot prior to coming onto this call, um, uh, which has to do with, um, integrated analysis. I mean, I think there very much is this notion that these data sets are going to be on the cloud and all compute will be done there against arbitrary kind of mergers. And I just don't think that's the experience currently. I know it's a little different than what we're having. Mostly data sets are downloaded and processed locally um, because you can then ar arbitrarily operate on them with code you write rather than some remote language. So I actually think that's more of a, a cost issue. People don't I mean we're getting way off topic though so maybe we should just <laughs> I'll talk to you about our, in our last five minutes I think search and use anyway it does fit in with with what the data is going to be used for what is the purpose of search and the use case any other closing thoughts from anyone on things they would like us to bring to bear yeah so this is Resham I had just put in a line in uh, in the chat uh, which I was editing so I think it will be good to have a forum uh, to have an exchange on what everyone is developing and then to see how we can build on each other's efforts. Uh, so at least I think that would be a good start, I think. Okay, so we're going to, I think we'll come away with some notion that we made progress on this. Very critical to understand the use case and to sort of realistically scale this against, you know, the, um, uh, against the, uh, sorry, I'm reading the, I'm reading all my instructions from people here. So I think we're actually in pretty good shape. So I think that's where we'll leave it at. We're going to go ahead and um, fill out the blue box based on these. Please go in and if you have strong opinions, absolutely re-edit this to, you, to your thing. And I think we will try to then revisit these topics as we go back into the, into the larger plenary session.